those of you interested in wanting to know how I carve my Ponamu Toki pendants, well, this is the video. So Ponamu is not a material you should use lightly, I wouldn't start off with Ponamu. It is a very precious material for more ways than one, not just the price point, but in terms of the mana that it, it, it holds for Māori, um, particularly New Zealand Ponamu. You also may know, know it is jade if you're not too sure what Ponamu is. But yeah, Ponamu is the word for jade in New Zealand, essentially. So I use a Dremel 4000. It's really the only power tool that I have. It was roughly almost $300, so $200-ish. Yeah, and I use diamond birds that I've got from Amazon, so that's the tools I'm using. So I do a rough cut first with the diamond cutting disc. Um, again, I get these from Amazon. They're not the greatest quality, but they do the job. Um, I am just starting out, so if anyone knows of better places to get these tools, leave in the comments, let me know, send me a DM. I'm learning, I'd love to get some more knowledge in Saponamu carving, just carving it in general. I have been self-taught. I wouldn't suggest starting off with Ponamu if you're just getting into carving. I have done a video, um, a previous video, which explains the history of the toki, drawing it, and a soap carving. So I'd suggest starting off with a softer material. Soap is super fun and easy to carve. Um, so yeah, we'd suggest starting out off with that. One thing that's really important when you're doing any stone or jade carving is to keep your um, your stone and your tools cool. So that's why I'm using this fancy water system, which is my hose and my bucket, to keep the stone cool, to keep my tools tool 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 or little to keep my tools cool um, as well. It just means you don't get sparks coming at you and your tools last longer as well. So the design that I'm doing is not the traditional designs that you would see on Toki. Most Toki, Toki are actually plain because it's a lot easier to bulk produce a plain Toki than it is to produce one with a design on it. So for my Toki, I'm doing three Komoran Manu or birds, which are a very important manu for the Ngāti Maniopoto iwi. So Maniopoto on his deathbed says Kia mou tonu ki tēnā, kia mou ki te kawa māro, whanake ake, whanake ake. So that translates to stick to that, the straight flying comorant. So there's a lot of other personal meaning attached to why I did three, three of these manu, but that's essentially where this design stems from. And I'm using just a small diamond diamond bird to get that detailing on my toki. So my toki pendants, well most of my pendants that I've done, I quite like to keep, I like to keep them a little bit rough. Obviously within reason, so still like a beautiful colour, um, but a shine to it, but nothing that looks machine made, if that makes sense. We kind of want to see a little bit of the carver in there, kind of like when you're doing a painting, I like to have brush strokes in my painting to show that it actually is a painting. A lot of effort and work has gone into it. When you're carving Ponamu, you have to do a lot of sanding, so I'm using 180 grit sandpaper all the way up to 1000 grit sandpaper. This is wet and dry sandpaper. You can get um, finer grits, but sanding is not a process that I enjoy very much, so I try to avoid um, as much sanding as possible if I can. So once I finish sanding my toki, I polish it, so I'm using a very, very budget polish. Um, it is olive oil and dinner. Essentially that's the only two things you need. Oh and I'm also using a cotton bud or a q-tip to get it in the details that I did. If anyone has been a suggestion on how to buff out the detail work, um, I'd probably assume it would be finer grit diamond burrs, but at the moment I only have coarse grit because I'm a poor art student, but yeah, you get the idea. You can also use polishing compounds, but we're going for the budget today. So the final part of the toki is threading it through. So I'm doing a three three braid cord. So I start off putting the looped end through the hole that I drilled into it. This can be a little rough depending on how large you've made your hole. You can make it bigger obviously in this process is a lot easier. So once you've done that, it can be a bit of a tight fit getting the last strand in. So a technique that I learnt off another YouTube channel called Campbell Carving. I'll link it in the bio. It's probably a much better video for learning how to bind your toki properly. But yeah, you thread it through using the two two loops if, if that makes sense. And I've done a whipping knot at the top to keep it secure and I'm just cutting off the ends. Again, I'll link in the bio to Campbell Carving where I learnt how to do the lashings for my toki. So now I'm adding a pull through loop onto it um, when I do my lashing so that we can pull 
through the end part um, when we finish wrapping it around so you start going down across then up and you follow that process the whole way so you go once you've gone up once you go down then you go across and then you go up and you continue that process with a long loop that you've long piece of string that you've left on after doing your whipping knot so continuing that process can take a little while but with this with this binding it's quite cool because every time you go around it makes your binding tighter and this would have a very practical use but because we have the hole that our cord is already attached to it is more for aesthetic reasons but it does keep things together a lot nicer but if you weren't were not to have a hole in the silky which some do um, then you would just then this would have a lot more functional use it would keep your your pendant on you but yeah I think having the hole in the silky does make it a lot more flat um, when you're wearing it but it is a choice you can have it or you don't have to have it because it can be seen as diminishing the mana or the the strength of the toki, but this is more for aesthetic reasons. I'm not gonna go chiseling away using this pendant. I'm um, using this toki, but yeah. And now that pull through loop is super handy because we can pull through the end and it's gonna say nice and secure now. And I always think this is such a beautiful um, binding and it adds so much more character to the toki. So I love this, is probably one of my favorite parts is just doing the binding and make it kind of all come together. You can see it's almost done. Yeah. So now you just cut off the end parts. Um, I'm using a three plait wax braid. Um, I'll link in the bio where I got all my materials from. But yeah, just doing a simple three braid plait. So just how, like how you would plait hair normally. That is all I am doing. And it's attached to, I have a small um, clamp, but you can do it without a clamp, um, that's what I, use, I did, but it just makes things a lot easier if it's anchored to something and you can try to keep your braid straight. And that is the toki. And I added um, another small piece in a loop so it could stay attached around your neck, but that is how I do my toki pendant. If you have any more questions or anything that you wanted to give in terms of feedback, let me know. I'm learning. YouTube is a new process for me, so is voiceovers, so I will hopefully get better. I'm a little bit mumbly, I know. But yeah, I hope you enjoyed learning about the process of doing a toki. And I'll I will link um, Campbell Carving and also check out Michael Matchett, who's a carver that I'm in contact with. Um, he has some really cool stuff and is a lot more knowledgeable than I am. I'm still a student, so yes, any feedback or knowledge that you want to give, um, or knowledge that you want to share is very much appreciated. So, kia ora, kakite anō. Just come.